If you've seen my previous video on the Stearman XA-21, you'll hopefully remember that in 1938, the United States Army Air Corps, the USAAC, issued a requirement for a new medium bomber. This needed to be able to carry a bomb load of 1,200 pounds at over 200 miles per hour. The competitors had a year to build their prototypes, but in that single year, it was plain to the USAAC that aeronautics were progressing so fast that they needed to raise the bar. So, when the due date came, they announced that they now wanted an aircraft that could carry at least 2,200 pounds of bombs over 1,200 miles at 300 miles per hour. From this came several successful designs, but probably the most famous of which was the North American B-25 Mitchell. This aircraft would be one of the great stalwarts of the upcoming Second World War, fighting in every theatre with all of the major Allied air forces and in huge numbers. The Mitchell proved tough, reliable and adaptable, even famously being launched from aircraft carriers for the famous Doolittle raid on Japan in April 1942. If that wasn't impressive enough, some of them carried modified tank cannons for ship busting, making it amongst the most heavily armed aircraft to ever fly. But just as the B-25 was the product of rapidly evolving requirements, it too was created in a period of rapid development. Because even before the Mitchell itself first flew in August 1940, the USAAC had issued specs for its replacement. In February of that year, they approached North American and ordered prototypes of what they wanted to replace the B-25, a year before that aircraft had even got into service. But the USAAC were planning ahead, and their requirements were ambitious. The new aircraft would be faster, longer ranged, and able to operate and bomb from an altitude of at least 30,000 feet. This would require full pressurisation of the aircraft, making it one of the first military aeroplanes to have this feature. And this in turn meant that the defensive weaponry would need to be remote operated in the fully sealed aircraft. These requirements gave birth to the XB-28 Dragon, which first flew on the 26th of April 1942, a mere eight days after its predecessor was making history bombing Tokyo. And though the B-25 was a great combat aircraft, and the XB-28 was evolved from it, the Dragon was an utterly reworked design that put it in a different league performance-wise. From the B-25, the XB-28 took a similar cockpit layout and tricycle undercarriage, though it swapped the Mitchell's distinctive twin tail for a single vertical fin. The fuselage was also more streamlined than its somewhat boxy predecessor. Power plant was improved by fitting two Pratt & Whitney R2800 double wasps that produced 2,000 horsepower each, in contrast to the 1,700 horsepower of the B-25's twin cyclones. This meant that though the Mitchell would go on to carry truly massive weapon loads during the war, in early 1942 the XB-28 had the heavier loadout. The B-25B at the time carried only a single 30 caliber machine gun in the nose and twin 50 caliber guns in turrets located on the aircraft's back and belly. The XB-28's defensive armament consisted of three twin 50 calibers in remote controlled ventral, dorsal and tail turrets. The gunners controlled these with periscope sights while they remained seated behind the pilots. Additionally, the XB-28 was designed to carry a 4,000 pound bomb load compared to the B-25's 3,000 pound. The extra power also meant that though the XB-28 was heavier than its forebear, it was much faster with a top speed of 372 miles per hour in comparison to the then standard B-25B which could make 300 miles per hour. More to the point, the Dragon performed this at 25,000 feet, as opposed to the B-25B's 15,000 feet. And here we come to the real key to the XB-28 requirement, its high altitude performance. The aircraft had a ceiling of 34,800 feet, and the focus on flying high and fast was exactly what the US bomber doctrine of the time called for when North American was contracted. In the early 1940s, the United States military believed that bombing should be conducted by day and with great precision by aircraft flying at heights that meant that any interceptors would 1. take a long time to get up to them, creating issues with reacting in time to stop the raid, 
and two, have problems operating effectively at such altitudes anyway. To this end, the United States had spent a literal fortune developing the Norden bomb site, and this high altitude accurate bombing doctrine had defined the design of basically all their heavy bombers that saw use in the Second World War, including the new B-29, which flew five months after the XB-28. And this was the thing about the XB-28. It was basically a mini superfortress. North American had delivered what appeared to be an outstanding aircraft in terms of exceeding the specification given to them. It's just that that specification, and the doctrine that inspired it, was incorrect. Admittedly, the USAAF still, at that point at least, thought that accurate high-altitude bombing was the correct approach for a strategic bombing campaign. But the XB-28 was no strategic bomber. It was meant to be a tactical one. By the time the Dragon flew for the first time, the USAAF was already learning how its medium bombers were going to be fighting, and that was generally at lower levels where their smaller payloads could be delivered accurately on target. This realisation was starting the evolution of the Mitchell into a massively armed wrecker, with the development and testing of the B-25G beginning around the same time that the XB-28 first flew. The B-25G was no high-altitude performer with expensive and complex cabin pressurisation, but more like the aircraft equivalent of a club, complete with solid nose housing for a 75mm cannon and intended to operate it down on the deck where it could smash Japanese shipping. And in addition to the Mitchell, the USAAF were also starting to get numbers of their new Martin B-26 Marauder into service by this point as well. This practically mimicked the XB-28's operational speed and bomb load, but dropped the need for high altitude performance, making for a cheaper aircraft both to buy and operate. And this is the thing. At the time of the XB-28 beginning its testing regime, the USAAF was engaged in a massive active conflict and didn't want to disrupt production of existing types that were serving perfectly well especially for a new aircraft that now didn't seem to fit the needs that the service was finding it had in the light of combat experience. So they decided they didn't need the XB-28 after all, at least as a bomber. Orders had already been issued for the development of a reconnaissance version of the aircraft, the XB-28A, and this did seem to have some promise. After all, the Dragon's high-speed, high-altitude profile would seem perfect for the job. Unfortunately, this aircraft was lost in August 1943 while being tested, and with that the Dragon was abandoned and the final example was eventually scrapped. To be fair, by this point the USAAF had plenty of other types capable of conducting reconnaissance and therefore constructing a dedicated production line for the aircraft was pointless, though it does seem a shame that they got rid of the final example. And that is the XB-28, an aircraft that was perfectly designed for the specified need and probably would have excelled in its intended role. But that role, and the doctrine that defined it, was ultimately faulty. Of course, this all raises an intriguing possibility. Had the Japanese not attacked the United States in December 1941, there is an excellent chance that the B-28 Dragon would have become the USAAF's standard medium bomber. And it is interesting to ponder how this aircraft may have fared in the event of the United States becoming involved in the war at a later date. Would it have proven more formidable than its predecessor? Or would the Mitchell's sheer adaptability have proven an advantage over the more complex and expensive Dragon? Now we can but speculate.